All right, what is up my homies? Welcome to Brain Melt University. Today we're gonna to be talking about network cabling, transmission media, and network infrastructure. Before we begin, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share with your friends. All of these things help the YouTube algorithm recommend us to more viewers and help us become a resource that can better serve you in the future. With all that said, let's get started. As a network technician, we need to have a very thorough understanding of the physical infrastructure that makes up our computer network. Computer networks can be made up of many different types of cabling and physical transmission media. A transmission media is simply the physical means by which we are transmitting data from one computer system to another. The two main categories of media that we use are wireless and wired. Our wireless media we will get into at the end of this video, but in reality, we should probably dedicate an entire video just to wireless so so that's going to be fast and dirty. We're not going to get into the various different standards of all of those media. And the same for the wired transmission media. There are a lot of different standards that govern how we construct our networks. And there's just a lot more information than what we're capable of covering in a 15 to 20 minute video. So there will likely be more videos in this series in the future covering the various standards. But with that said, let's get into the nitty gritty. It's important to understand the different communication media because if you don't understand what type of cabling connects your devices together and what purpose that cable serves, you're likely not going to be able to manage that network with any degree of familiarity or competence. One of the most common cabling types that you see with home networks is coaxial cable. In the United States, when we began retrofitting the telephone and cable TV companies, into internet service providers, we continue to use the same physical infrastructure as what was already in place. As a result, cable TV kind of came out on top because the coaxial cabling used by television networks was just far more capable of transmitting high data rates than the telephone cabling used by plain old telephone system providers. Today, these differences are a lot less noticeable as both telephone providers and cable providers have created fiber optic backbones to carry all the information. So both of these types of providers are capable of providing very similar data rates. However, the cabling that runs to our home is still more than likely going to be some sort of coaxial cabling. A coaxial cable is a cable in which you have a single copper core cable surrounded by several layers of protection. This single cable is used for both transmission and receipt of data, meaning that this is a half duplex system. Half duplex simply means that data can travel both directions, but can only travel one direction at a time. A great example of half duplex communication is human speech. If you're sitting in a room and two people are attempting to talk at the exact same time, then they're probably not going to fully comprehend what the other one has to say. They're only going to be able to pick up whatever information was sent while they were not physically speaking. This is a perfect example of half duplex communication. One person has to talk, stop, and then the other one has to respond. Coaxial cabling is typically not used beyond a modem. A modem is a device that converts one form of signal into another. Typically, modems will convert signals sent across a coaxial cable and transmit them out to our next type of cabling, which is by far the most common cable used around the planet, this is a twisted pair copper cable. Twisted pair copper cabling typically involves one cable made up of several wires that are twisted around each other at different rates. This twist rate slightly changes the length of each cable inside, meaning that it's a lot less likely for these cables to experience what's called crosstalk. Crosstalk is where electromagnetic interference is generated by some form of transmission media and interferes with another transmission media media generally trying to accomplish the same task. By twisting the wires inside these individual cables, we are able to negate a lot of this electromagnetic interference caused by our own cabling. In twisted pair cabling, we generally have two types. We have your plain old telephone cabling, which generally is made up of between four and six individual wire strands inside a single cable. DSL providers, which usually started out as telephone companies, usually provide their connection to a modem in the form of either a four wire or six wire connector. These are the same wires that are used to control landline telephones. And these will either be using an RJ11 four pin connector, 
or an RJ12 six pin connector. Depending on the type of cabling involved and the type of connector, you could expect higher data rates out of a system which is wired with the RJ12 six wire cabling versus the RJ11. However, in most rural areas, you are still restricted to the four wire cabling. However, when we're dealing with individual computer connections, most switches, routers, and PCs are all going to use what is called an RJ45 connector. The RJ45 looks very similar to the RJ11 and RJ12, with the major difference that it's not backwards compatible. You can still put an RJ11 connector into an RJ12 socket, and you can even kind of fish one into an RJ45, but because an RJ45 has to fit eight wires instead of four or six, the connector itself is much wider and is not backwards compatible with these older cabling types. Your RJ45 connectors are typically fed by some sort of twisted wire pair that is classified as either STP or UTP. An STP cable is a shielded twisted pair cable. STP cabling is more expensive, but it provides additional protection against EMI. STP cabling will usually have some sort of separator running down the middle of the cable that separates each individual color pair from the rest, and will sometimes have aluminum foil wrapped around the entire group or even around each individual color pair. Because of all this additional metal foil, Oil wrapped inside this cable, STP is a lot more expensive and is not nearly as common in use than UTP. UTP is unshielded twisted pair cabling and this is by far the most common that you see. We usually refer to these as ethernet cabling or if you're a pronunciation snob, an ethernet cable. However, the cabling itself does not guarantee that this is ethernet cabling and there are other forms of cabling which are classified under the IEEE ethernet standard. So even though I'll probably refer to this as ethernet cabling just out of habit, do keep in mind that ethernet is not specific to copper cabling. Twisted pair cabling for ethernet networks has undergone several revisions over the past several years. Each time a revision is made, the quality of the cable is improved and cabling that adheres to these different standards is given what's called a category classification. The earliest of these that we still see today is category three cabling. Category three, or just cat three for short cabling, was capable of transmitting signals at 10 megabits per second. In the early 90s, this was a very massive amount of bandwidth when you consider that the vast majority of people connected to the internet were only actually getting 56 kilobits per second from a standard dial-up connection. When we upgraded the ethernet standard to fast ethernet, meaning that we went from 10 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second, we needed better cabling to accomplish the task. So the standards were rewritten to accommodate this and new cabling had to be created that adhered to these new standards. This new standard was category five or cat five. Cat five cabling is rated for 100 megabits per second. And while it can exceed the this speed, the higher speed you push through one of these cables, the more susceptible you are to transmission errors. CAT5E, or CAT5 Enhanced, was an update to the standard to allow fast ethernet cabling to be able to support speeds up to one gigabit per second. Cat5e is probably the most ubiquitous cable that you're going to run into when you're working with computer networks. It is still sold today, even though Cat5e has been around since the 90s, and it's just extremely easy to work with. I still use Cat5e for my classroom, primarily because it's a lot cheaper than having to buy something newer, and also it's a lot easier to work with, meaning it's a lot easier for for me to teach students how to work with cabling. And even though this has been around for literally decades now, you're still not seeing computer networks in high abundance in the United States that exceed one gigabit per second. Just like Cat5 and Cat3, you can exceed one gigabit per second from Cat5e cabling. You just have to be aware that the higher your bandwidth, the more susceptible you are to electromagnetic interference. And Cat5e cabling is probably going to provide a minimal and non satisfactory satisfactory amount of protection, the higher bandwidth you try and push through that same cable. Cat5e was later replaced by Cat6 cabling. And while you will ubiquitously hear people refer to Cat6 cabling, more than likely they're actually referring to Cat6a cabling. But I'll talk about the difference between those in a second. Cat6 cabling was rated for a maximum throughput 
of about six and a half to seven gigabits per second. Cat6 was a major improvement over Cat5e, but it does have some major limitations. Number one, it's not rated for a full 10 gigabit load. So if you are dealing with an interface designed to push 10 gigabits, if you try and push those through a Cat6 cable, you're probably going to end up with transmission errors because you're exceeding the maximum rating for that cable. All of our previous standards, whether it was Cat3, Cat5, or Cat5a, were rated for a maximum distance of 100 meters. Cat6, on the other hand, was far more susceptible to EMI the longer the cable was. So Cat6 has a maximum transmission range of 50 meters. Now this doesn't mean that you can't create a network that is larger than 50 meters in length. That just means you have to implement some sort of repeating device like a switch that can repeat that signal and retransmit it at full strength at that 50 meter mark. By using Cat6 cabling over Cat5e, you you would have to place twice as many repeaters into a geographically large network. This is why Cat6 was very quickly upgraded to the Cat6 Augmented or Cat6A type of cabling. Cat6A was rated for a full 10 gigabits per second connection, and it was able to return the 100 meter maximum distance in order to allow you to work with it. Most Cat6 cabling that you see today is actually Cat6A, but you do wanna make sure if you're buying super cheap Cat6 cabling that you are actually buying Cat6A. Otherwise, you might end up having to put in far more repeating devices and you could end up losing all of the money you thought you were saving by buying cheap cabling. Current twisted pair cabling standards such as the Cat7 and Cat7A cabling are designed to bridge the gap between 10 gigabit and 100 gigabits. They are only available in STP because of how susceptible they are to electromagnetic interference. And and at this day and age, it's cheaper to just buy fiber optic cabling than it is to keep going up with these Cat7 standards. You can still get Cat7 cabling and the price is dropping, but just due to the sheer difference in cost between plastic or glass with fiber optic and the copper itself and all of the metal foils that go inside, it's just way cheaper from a material standpoint. And so over the next decade or two, we're probably going to see a far greater emphasis placed on fiber optic patch cable and fiber optic interfaces on switches versus the continuation of RJ45 interfaces and copper cabling. So since we've talked about these different categories of cabling, we do need to talk about fiber optic cabling now. When it comes to patch cabling, these are generally referred to as biaxial cabling. So rather than coaxial, where both transmit and receive are sharing a single line, biaxial cabling uses one cable for transmit and one for receive. This allows fiber optic cabling to operate in full duplex mode. It can both transmit and receive at the exact same time, and that's one reason why fiber optic cabling is able to operate at higher bandwidths than your typical copper cabling a lot easier. Fiber optic cabling can get pretty overwhelming when you start to look at the sheer number of different fiber optic connectors and the different types of cabling, as well as the different modes of fiber optic cabling. However, it's not as difficult as it might at first appear, and so we're just going to go into some broad understanding of what fiber optic cabling is. Fiber optic cabling is a transmission media that sends light signals versus electrical signals like what we covered with twisted pair and coaxial cabling. As a result, rather than sending electrical signals, there's just some sort of light device at each end. Whether this is an LED or a laser usually depends on the standard of fiber optic cabling and whether this is cabling designed for long distance or short distance communication. When it comes to fiber optic patch cables, there are dozens of different connector types, but there are four main ones that have really won out in the fiber optic patch game. Two older standards really aren't used that much anymore, but you might still see them if you're working for an organization that needs to upgrade its switch infrastructure pretty soon and just doesn't have the funding to. You're also likely to see this in classrooms where they might be operating on a limited budget and they're working with donated equipment that has been surplused by different companies who just want to use them as a tax write-off. The four major connector types are ST, SC, 
MTRJ and LC. ST cabling is a much older cabling style usually used in the 1990s and this was kind of a bayonet connector style connector where you had a round connector with a little notch and you just pushed it in, twisted and it locked in place just like a bayonet on an old military surplus rifle. ST connectors were smaller square connectors and these found a lot more acceptance during the early 2000s. SC connectors usually connected to what was called a GBIC interface. This was a module that you could plug into an interface into your device, which could change whether this cable was operating in multi-mode or single mode. I'll get to that in a second. However, GBICs and SC cabling were rather bulky and could take up quite a bit of space, especially if you needed to store that cabling somewhere. This is why we ended up moving to the LC and MTRJ connectors. LC is by far the most common, and so we'll spend most of our time working on LC cabling versus MTRJ cabling. However, both of these could fit into what was called an SFP. SFP stands for Small Form Factor Pluggable. An SFP GBIC is designed to replace the original GBIC and was about a third of the size of your traditional GBIC interfaces. This was also allowed because because of how small your LC connectors are. This allows you to save a lot of space when it comes to the interfaces themselves, the fiber optic transceivers that you're plugging into your devices, as well as the cabling as the connectors don't take up nearly as much space. Now among all of these connector styles, there are two types of connectors for each one. There is a UPC connector and a APC connector. UPC connectors are usually flat or slightly rounded and they're designed to butt up directly against each other in order to send a signal. However, there is a small chance that given enough wear on the cabling or the interface, these two cables could become slightly misaligned and they will no longer be able to send a signal across those connectors. Because of the apertures that are sending these fiber optic light signals down a cable are so small, it is possible to misalign them and end up with a cable that doesn't work. This is why APCs were created. APC is an angle connector in which one side is angled and the other side has to be angled to match so when you plug them in they have to line up it's impossible to misalign them these are a lot more expensive and it also means you have to buy special cabling that have these connectors as well as transceivers that have a complementary angled connector with them you don't see these as often but you can usually spot the difference because the connectors are going to be green in color the nice thing about fiber optic is that everything is color coded. There are two different modes of fiber optic cabling. You have multi-mode cabling and single mode cabling. Single mode cabling is cabling where you send a signal and it travels a straight line down that cable. Single mode cabling is usually easy to identify because its connectors are blue and its cabling is yellow. If you see a yellow cable with a blue connector, you are almost certainly working with a single mode cable. Multi -mode cabling on the other hand is cabling that is designed for the signal to be able to bounce inside the cable. So if you look at a fiber optic cable there are three main components. You have the core which is the small strand of glass or plastic that is designed to transmit that light signal from one end of the cable to the other. You have cladding which reflects that light signal back into the core if it gets misdirected. And then you have the jacket which protects the cladding and the rest of the cable from outside light sources sources and possibly some environmental factors such as moisture as well. A multi-mode cable is going to have a much larger core because the light has to be able to bounce kind of like a radio wave. Your single mode cable because it's designed to travel a straight line is going to be much smaller in diameter. Now we are talking about cores that are measured in microns so these are really small cabling smaller and thinner than a human hair. In the early days of fiber optic cabling you could actually make one of these cables by hand. Now you actually need pretty specialized equipment in order to be able to make a fiber optic cable, especially if you're working with single mode LC cabling. Multi-mode cabling is usually identified by either a black or beige connector and the cabling is going to be orange. Now multi-mode does use a variety of core widths and these are sadly not interchangeable. So to identify some multi-mode cabling has teal jackets versus orange jackets, which identifies the non standard or in this case becoming the new standard multi-mode cabling for the core width. Now you cannot mismatch a single mode transceiver or SFP module 
with a multi-mode cabling or vice versa. That is why you need to make sure that whatever SFP or GBIC module you're using matches the cabling you intend to connect it together. It also should go without saying, but I'm going to reiterate, you cannot combine a multi-mode transceiver on one switch with a single mode transceiver on another. Now we are starting to get a little long, but I do wanna talk about our final transmission media and that is wireless signals. Typically wireless signals are accomplished using electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves occur in a number of different spectrums, but the two main ones that we operate in for computer networks are the radio frequency spectrum and the microwave spectrum. Now these electromagnetic waves can take many forms and operate on many protocols, such as Bluetooth, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, etc. But in computer networking, obviously the main one that we're focused on is the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi standard. These electromagnetic waves can be interfered with any number of ways through any form of electromagnetic interference, and these can even interfere with wired cabling if we're operating at the right frequencies and we're using cabling that is not properly protected or properly terminated. In order to use some form of wireless transmission media, we need to have radios built into our devices. We need to have a transmitter and we need to have a receiver. And in many cases, this is a single device that is just combined to create a transceiver. When we're dealing with Wi-Fi networks, we're usually having to do some sort of translation, where a device that does not have a physical interface to be able to connect to the wired infrastructure is using a set of radios to gain wireless interface to that same wired connection. Any Wi-Fi network has to eventually connect back to a physical wired infrastructure. Any form of wireless communication is a lot less secure because it is much easier to intercept and recover those signals. This is why things like encryption are are extremely important when you're dealing with wireless transmission. And it also is extremely important to know that there are way more things that can interfere with an electromagnetic wave than a single cable. Another advantage of fiber optic over your wireless and wired copper connections is that rather than sending electromagnetic waves or electrical signals, Fiber optic sends light, meaning it is completely immune to EMI. This is one reason why fiber optic cabling is finally starting to gain widespread acceptance because it's immune to EMI and it's cheaper than CAT7 or CAT7A cabling in this day and age. The major drawbacks of using fiber optic cabling is that you can't make it by hand as easily as you can with copper cabling, and you need to have the proper transceivers and interfaces, and most switches, PCs, and routers today still primarily use RJ45 copper connection interfaces. But with all of that said, I think we're about ready to wrap up. This was supposed to just be a quick overview and I'm starting to see now that my original recording is almost 45 minutes. So after editing, we're gonna be well over 20 minutes. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please drop them in the comments below. It's been real and I'll see you here next time on Brain Melt University.